um, Mr. Charles Wright. This is uh, Sherard from the Sherard Show. You are on air um, with your interview this morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. I, I'm, How about you? I'm doing okay. Thanks for asking, and welcome to the Sherard Show. Again, those who are just tuning in, this is Mr. Charles Wright we have on his phone. He's a legendary singer, instrumentalist, and songwriter, and he also um, is a member of Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. And today's topic we're going to be uh, talking about is um, music today, um, the difference from yesteryear to today, as well as talking about some of the current events that are going on uh, in the news. Speaking of George Floyd, the uh, um, assassination of George Floyd, as well as um, Eric Garner and a couple others in relation to um, what's happened in the past. So welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Now, let's jump right into it, Mr. Wright. Now, um, first of all, you are a, a, a musician that has been in the industry for many years. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in the industry as a musician. You know, uh, strange as it seems, but when I was a child in Mississippi, uh, my father's sharecropping partner, uh, boss, convinced my father that the blues was the devil of music. So he wouldn't allow us to listen to the blues or anything, any secular music. We could listen to gospel. Uh, we could listen to spiritual music. And strange as it seems, country and western. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, that's, this transpired to uh, <clears throat> after I moved to California, at the age of 12, and by the time I was 14, I started going, I was going to um, junior high school, and I'd be walking home, and the kids be singing all these songs by groups like the Clovers and Richard Bear and the Dreamer, and I, and I had never heard this music, so I found out where they was, they were listening to a show called the Honey Hancock. Uh, show that comes on four o'clock every day in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Un Hancock was an older white gentleman, but he played all black music. So he played all the blues and the rhythm and blues. And, and I started listening, and man, uh, by the time I got to high school, the first day I went to high school, actually. I would sit down, I went to the lunch counter and bought me some lunch, sit down with my spaghetti in a row, and now, just as I sit down, I heard this sound coming from the distance. And I had never heard anything like it before. So I wrapped my food up, and I went walking and looking for the, this sound, that I, but it kept stopping, so I had to stop in my tracks, wait till it started again. So I eventually got around behind a bungalow where there was four guys singing doo-wop. Man, I never heard anything like that. Raw doo-wop, no music behind it, just beautiful harmony. And it's funny you say this, that. Um, it's funny you say that, Mr. Ray. I, I just want to say because um, really quick, doo-wop. Um, is one of my favorite eras and genre of music, and you were right part of it um, with doo-wop. Now, did you sing doo-wop um, after you started hearing those guys performance in doo-wop? Did that inspire you to start performing doo-wop? Yeah, well, these guys, we rehearsed there every day at, at uh, lunchtime. So I was there. I went back there every day. And uh, so one day... Uh, I just got the feeling like I needed to be a part of that. So I, uh, I actually started me a group. And uh, man, the name was, was the Twilighters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, and within a year's time, I had made my first hit record. The first time I went in the studio, made a record called Eternity. It was was a, a big record here in L.A. for sure. I don't know how. So eternally, and it was um, performed by your group called the Twilighters. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
mean, now how does it go? How does, can, you, can you sing a little bit how it goes since way back then? Yeah, you can go on the, <laughs> you can go online there. They'll play it for you if you want to. Yeah, well, uh, those, who are, those who are just listening, we will be playing that, um, the hit uh, song that he has from the Twilighters. I actually love the song. I want my audience to hear it called uh, Eternity. Uh, Eternally. That's a beautiful song. Um, have you heard it? Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a big doo fan, so I just wanted okay. to do an acapella version of it. But um, Oh, don't, don't, start, don't start that with me right here. <laughs> you got me so rapping today, all right? <laughs> 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 yeah, so anyway, that group after, uh, that group lasted a year or so for the act that mm-hmm. it ended up busting up because really we we didn't really make any money. We were, got screwed out of everything that we were supposed to make wow. live <laughs> and on the morning. So anyway, it ended up then uh, uh, Jesse Belvin, uh, who was my hero, okay. And before I even started singing, I heard him sing a song called One Little Blessing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Radio, so I looked him up in the phone booth and I called him this bell. And I want to sing it. I want to sound just like you. Mm-hmm. He gave me the best advice anybody ever gave me. Which was? He said, get your own style, boy, and leave mine the F alone. <laughs> he came off that route to you when you said that? Well, that's what he said, yeah. But he was gracious enough to invite me over to his house that at Saturday for a rehearsal with a group called the Turks, who also had some hit records on the radio. So, I mean, I went to that rehearsal, and I was in seventh heaven. After that, that's when I started Twilight. I had to do something. I had to be in this business. I didn't know what I was doing. But then he so after that group died down, he put me in a group called the Shields. Mm-hmm. We had a, had a huge record. I know you heard you cheated. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now let me ask you a question. Um, um, before you're telling a very interesting story, but I, I want to get a little details on a couple of things now. Um, Jesse Belvin, uh, can you tell the audience who Jesse Belvin was? Greatest thing that ever happened to Los Angeles, and they never, ever play one of his records here. Today, what and he was—he's was a genius. He made many hit records. He had a, he had a, 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 other names of groups and stuff. Cause what he did, <clears throat> Jesse, after uh, he took me on his wing, and he would go to Hollywood, and he would sell songs to these barracudas, and then he. They were the only person who could really sing them with him, so they ended up hiring him to sing when he put another name of another group. And uh, so he, he made many hit records, but two of his major records were Good Night, My Love, mm-hmm. and and Guess Who. But Jesse was the kind of guy, He all day long he had groups come in his house and he practiced, and he had teach them harmony parts and teach them songs and stuff. And that's what he did. That's all he did. And uh he got broke and needed money, go to Hollywood, he sell the same song to three or four people. <laughs> and then the way he explained to me, well, they ain't gonna pay me no how. So I may well get what I can out of them now. Now, but, uh, you know, now now um he was a young man. He didn't live very long. As a matter of fact, he passed away. He got killed in a car accident. Twenty seven. 27 years old in 1960, but um, in his career, he inspired a lot of people, including um, people like Sam Cooke, he inspired... All of us at Los Angeles. Yes, he was very inspirational. So now, after um, um, Jesse Belvin, what happened next, after you um, left working with him? Well, I did the Shield thing, you know, know, for two or three years. And then I decided I maybe I better give this doo wop thing up, and because I started learning the guitar, but because I had to, we used to go on the road with the Shields, and we end up with a band with sometimes they have twenty or thirty pieces in it, everything but a guitar, and all the group record all you cheated had on was a guitar. Mm-hmm. So I started learning how to play the guitar. Then I became 
uh, no, I got involved with another group called the Gallahans. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a couple of medium hits, and but we was really on our way. But we had a run in with a guy named Alan Freed. Mm-hmm. And, and what and happened he, there? Alan Freed, we, this was the third group I got involved with, so I talked to these guys. I had been down on the road and seen all the other guys and see all what was happening with all the entertainers that I worked with on one show or another. So I taught these guys skits, and and we were really, we practiced every day, the best group I ever got involved with. And we would do these shows, and Alan Free's wife was crazy about us. And so she's always standing in the wings uh, when we were performing. And uh, Alan Free hated us because she liked us. Now, now who was Alan Free? Alan Free is a man who's supposed to start the rock and roll. Mm-hmm. He's a disc jockey. I think he was from Cleveland, but he ended up in New York. And he was one who was famous for taking payola, and he got busted for it a few times. He had to leave the East Coast and came out here. When he got out here, he was drinking really heavy. He was a, really, uh, actually, was a boozer, really. And uh, he would, he was a very rude person. And one time, uh, one of the guys in the group, we go on the stage with our skit, and we be dressed in these funky clothes, but then we peel them off during during the skit, and then by the end of the show, we got our fancy uniforms on. So one of the guys threw a sweater in it, and it landed on his, on uh, Alan Free's wife's shoulder, and you know we came off the stage, and he he's standing there. Which one of you dumb son of a so and so threw your sweater and hit my wife on the head with it? Oh no! And she, she's standing there saying, "Mr. Free, I'm mean, saying, honey, uh, I'm glad landed on me. Leave these kids alone." He pushed her aside and he gave us hell. So one time, we had another record was going. Dick Clark had picked it up, was playing it every day for a dance record. It was ballad. And Alan Free wanted us to do this TV show when the record started rising. So we went and did the show. Mm-hmm. We didn't know nothing about payola. We, so the guys up there was in this group, they were from Seattle. I'm the only one who was local. And so they needed their money. And they never sent the money. So we said, Let, we went to the union and uh, told them that what was happening. They was glad to help us because they didn't want them bringing that uh, uh, pay all the stuff out here that because it really didn't exist out here. Man, next thing I know, the president of the company tell me, send these guys back to Seattle. They're through. They over. It's all over for them. Alan Free killing their record. Why? Because you filed a suit. You filed a, a complaint against him at the union. Wow. Now, Charles, that, I'm going to interject something really quick. Now, how old were you? Um, when this happened, and what year was this when you were getting ripped off by Alan Freed? Well, you asked for a lot of information there, but I was about <laughs> 20. Okay, all right. And um, you're still you're still new to the music industry? Oh, yeah. Well, when the, when he, the president asked me to send them home, he also asked me to stay on as an A&R director mm-hmm. because... Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another guy, Bruce Johnson. Justin, he was the A and R director, but he messed around and and they dropped a whole album on the floor of tape and he tried to put it back together and couldn't get it put it back together. So he left and joined the Beast Boys. So I took his job as A and R director. And then I produced a record for called those oldies but goodies reminds me of you. For him, you ever hear that record? I sure have. I sure have. 
Okay, so I produced that record, and he refused to pay me, so I left there. And then I became a studio musician. Matter of fact, I was what the, one of the top guitar players in L.A. for two or three years there until the watch band began to rise, and I had, couldn't do it anymore. Now, you used so, to, um, I, I see that you also were associated with Johnny Guitar Watson, and you were touring with him for a little while and recording with him. Is that correct? I recorded with, with Johnny Guitar Watson and Larry Williams. Uh, we did some stuff on Little Richard and a lot of people. And uh, Johnny was kind of like a friend of mine. And uh, he's one of the most respected musicians I've ever known. He was a fantastic musician. Guitar, organ, piano, flute, just a great musician. Wow. And a great performer. And, and, and um, I'm also seeing in, in your impressive career, um, Mr. Wright, that you also um, managed Bill Withers for a brief period, the late great Bill Withers. Is that correct? No, I was going to produce Bill Withers, okay? And then Bill was hanging around me for about a year and a half, and he's come to all my recording sessions and everything. And, I, and we had a deal where I was going to produce him, but he wanted more as a royalty, then the record company would pay me as both a producer and a recording artist. So we could never come to those terms. Uh, he was actually being, excuse my expression, chicken shit. He was hanging around me, and eventually, that's my band playing. He stole my band. That's my band playing all of those hit records he made. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Even on Lean On Me? Oh, uh, it Lean On Me. My grandma's hand. That's uh, that's my band. I didn't even know they were. They had. I knew that there was a lot of jealousy inside of my band with two guys. That the drummer and the, the the trombone player ended up playing piano with Withers, and uh, I didn't even know it until I saw him on TV. Oh my goodness! Wow! It, it goes to show that Charles. I see that you um really had some ups and downs in the music industry just from um the way it was and people getting ripped off. Um, is it has much changed in the industry since you started to now? Uh yeah, a lot can change, but I personally I'm I, I'm cool. I mean I mean God's really been good to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I am blessed, man. One thing I'm happy I didn't get hung up on them dope like uh the kind of dope people got hung up on and they end up selling their uh product for yeah for nothing. I had a guy call me and tell me ask me I wanna sell my publisher. I, no, sir. Well I got I got Flystone publishing, I got George Clinton, how come I can't get yours? Because I ain't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for those who uh, just tuned in, we are talking to the le legendary Charles Wright, um, or the guitarist, performer, instrumentalist. Um, he's also the, the the part of the band Watch 103rd um, Street. I'm the, I, I created the Watch 103rd Street rhythm band. Oh my goodness! And and and, and let me stand corrected on that. And then also um, the hit maker from the song. One of my favorite songs is Fresh Yourself. So in our next segment after this commercial break, we're going to talk to you, uh, Charles, more about his hit, as well as the state of what's going on in the news today. I'm sure Art will be right back after this. Oh 
Conversation with Mr. Charles Wright, um, the hit maker, the song maker, uh, instrumentalist, musician, and also he has a, he's an author of a book. The book is entitled "Up from Where We Come." Um, Charles, tell us a little bit about your inspiration from the book. And about it. the book is just a part of uh, a book I've been writing for the last forty years. I decided I better put it out, and when I did that, I realized. I couldn't put it all in one volume. So I did the volume, which I think is a very uh, interesting volume for, because it deals with the, from the time I was born to the time I left Mississippi at 12 years old. And all of the events that happened between three months before I was born, I don't know, don't ask me how I know. But that's where my book starts, three months before I was born, and it ain't no lie. Wow. Until now, um, you were born, you, you come from Clarksdale, Mississippi. Now, besides yeah. um, the legendary Sam Cooke, a lot of artists have come from um, from Clarksdale. Who are some of them that were born in Clarksdale besides yourself? Muddy Waters used to live right across the street from my grandmother. Uh, I think John Lee Hooker, Ike Turner. Uh, Morgan Friedman, uh, I mean, most all of your blues singers. Uh, 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 did I say Lightning Hopkins? No, uh, oh, I didn't know that. Um, uh, you could go on and on. Most all your blues singers and the gospel singers come out of Clarksdale. I don't know what it is, people in Clarksdale. I want to know. know what it is. <laughs> Something in the water is magical. So many talented people it, come from Clarksdale. It might be the way we were treated. I don't know what it is, but there's some about the people from Clarksdale. And, and everybody in the world knows that's where the blues started. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been back there. I went back last time I was back there. It was about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. What's and it like going back to us back home after all these years? It's something else, man. You go back there, the white people who used to make us feel like we was nothing. Right now they so nice, but it ain't real. So no, okay. Well that that means to what um our next topic we want to speak about. In the news, um, you've seen the murder of George Floyd, um, in Minneapolis just a few days ago from the cops. And then also you see about the um, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, which happened on February 27th. Um, it just came into the news um, back in April. And then also um, you see so many um, African-Americans being brutally murdered by the police. Now, this is something that's really nothing new for you uh, to see, is it, Charles? No, it's not, but can you tell me? I'll give you a puzzle. How do you get eight years of white resentment? I don't know how. Elect a black president. <laughs> wow, what a what a, a riddle! Excellent. Mm. Explain. Well, that's where we are now. We're in the wake of Barack Obama, who really couldn't do a damn thing for us anyway. Mm -hmm. But we're in the wake of his presidency. All these people have been resenting him all. You can tell now 
from all those eight years he was in the White House, and and it's coming out in him, and uh, and and uh, the Trump when he had his first conference with the, with the police department departments, uh, he told them I he said, "Don't be so gentle with him, rough him up." So they have a license from the head honcho and Charles to do whatever they please with us. Mm-hmm. And what they really please, they wish we were all dead. But now this man with this knee on this man's neck, okay, mm-hmm. for eight and a half minutes, that, was, that wasn't nothing, just that man. Somebody told him to do that. This is done so we could get all emotional, run out in the street and give each other the, the corona disease. That's what this is for. This is a plan, and we don't understand Wow. Now, um, in, in your growing up in Clarksdale, um, as well as um, the early years in Los Angeles, have you ever experienced anything like this um, or seen anything like this or what's going on now in 2020? In my lifetime, you mean? Yes, sir. Yeah, it keeps happening. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it just happened that somebody's catching it on camera every once in a while now, but it happens all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had my run in with the police that were very unfair. I mean, I mean, I've had man handcuff me to uh, the, the the sun visor, the, not the sun visor, the the. You remember when they used to have the little things you turn and when they open it and it cut, the, cut the air off from coming directly at you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And he had one of them things one night, and he asked, uh, there was another brother and, and I together, the other brother got, he ran away. So one cop went looking for him, and he this one took me around the corner park and asked me, What's the other nigga's name? I said, I don't know. Man, I shouldn't have said that. It hit me dead in the eye. Hardly can while I'm handcuffed there. Oh, no. Now, now this was when you were in uh, Clarksdale or you were here in Los Angeles? This was right here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And the song, song, I mean, song of gun name was Love, <laughs> believe it or not. Oh, I never will forget. I mean, he, that eye caused me problems for a long time. Oh my goodness! Now you were you were just coming back from performing or what? No, no, we were just kids walking in the streets, you know, and it, uh, at night, and uh, they rolled up on us. It was three of us actually, and they rolled up on us. And well, I didn't know we didn't know who they were. They came uh, busting through, real they hit the gas real fast, uh, and came come in at us real fast with the lights real bright, so we all scattered. Mm-hmm. And next thing I know, somebody sit behind me saying, "Halt! I'll shoot." So, uh, wow! Wow! Anyway, so, so so Charles, what is your perspective on things um, now? Do you feel that racism is alive and well? Um, we just now, many of us Who? are just not taking our head out of the sand, or do you feel it's gotten worse over the years? Who can deny that it's alive and well? I mean. It's undeniable. Even the racist had to admit that it's alive and well today. And it always has been. It's coming out in the open is what's happening. And uh, But they knew it all the time. The police are here to serve and protect white folks against us. That's why they were created. We don't know that. But that's the fact. Most of the time they ride around in a black and a white car. The part they're riding in is white. Yeah, wow. all of that's now, like that's logical. You, you know, um, Charles. See, I've, I've interviewed so many um, um, legends such as yourself. You know, like Mel Carter, uh, Jim Gilstrap on the show, Stevie Wonder, so many, and they always speak the same story about when they were touring, like especially down south. Um, many times they couldn't even stay in a hotel, the same hotel that they were performing in. They couldn't stay. They had to find some, one that was many miles away, or sometimes they had to sleep in their own car before they performed at a place. And they had hit records out there and still couldn't stay in an um, a, a all-white hotel. 
that what they were performing in, the next night. Is that something that you experienced as well? Well, yeah, I've done several Dick Clark tours, okay? And Dick Clark, he had so much power. We would be coming into town, they sent out 12 motorcycle cops to escort us back into town. Mm -hmm. And he would take the white artists on the bus to the Hilton Hotel and send us to another hotel on the other side of town, usually a sleep pad, where black people could stay. Mm -hmm. This was in the 60s. He used to do that kind of stuff, you know. I didn't respect him because he did. He was he allowed that to happen. He should have used his power. After all, he used our music to get over. He should have used his power to do something to level the playing ground. He didn't do it. So, so Mr. yeah, Mr. I've been. You 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 figuring that um. He, he had all the power to be able to do that, to put everybody in the same hotel, black and white, in the Hilton if he wanted to, but he chose not to. Is that correct? That's what I'm saying. Hmm. And, you know, um, the thing is that what makes it so unfortunate is that um, one man said um, just recently, um, everybody wants to be black until the cops pull you over. They definitely, <laughs> take over. They definitely love our music and everything about us, but they don't know anything about being black once the cops pull us over. Man, when it comes to our music like that, I was just, I'm just doing something now and then. I'm about to do something on Facebook or someplace about that. Mm -hmm. We created what they call rock and roll music. Mm -hmm. Now, what, last week, I went online to see who were the highest earning musicians, rock and roll musicians. Mm -hmm. There was, I looked up 20 of them, all right? Mm -hmm. There were 20 of them, and they had, like Mick Jagger has $263 million. Uh, Paul McCarthy's got $1.2 billion. And it goes on and on and on, and they have a black one in the bunch. Oh, my goodness. I go back to Clarksdale, and I tell you what's going to happen here, I'm in, in my estimation. They're going to kill all those people. They don't need to pick cotton no more with this disease. Wow. I go back there, and I see all those poor people back there living, and they just, the houses that, but still there that I was was there when I was a child and they leaning towards the ground. They just waiting for all those people to die off. Do you know where a FEMA coffin is? No, I don't. You should look them up. They got them stacked up by the millions. And they shipping them all over the place, down south at least I know. By the truckload right now. I was on Facebook a lady ran into a truck with about five, six thousand of them things on them. And they hold five, six people apiece. And they shipping them down south. Wow. wow. And we don't even know. I, I've been running, I've been, I've been hit to see the coffins for about three, four years. And I see, I see the guy stacked up on somebody's property back there in Georgia. But I'm wondering what they got me stacked, what they going to use them for. They got to have a use for them. Why would they create all those coffins? Mm -hmm. that, now, wow. that's some grab. I don't want to get the audience all involved in, in too much of that, but that's a reality that we have to deal with. That's a, that's a whole new level of evil and wickedness um, that's really sad yeah. to hear. You know? And um, yeah. I don't know if you agree with this, but um, black people nowadays need to become more educated and know who they fight and they're not fighting themselves, but to know that we're fighting against an enemy that um, never really loved us from the beginning, but loved what we do, but didn't love us. And now, well, this and now that we need to, um, we're more educated, or at least we're more aware of it than we were back then in so many ways, but what are we doing with the knowledge that we have now? 
I don't I don't know. We uh, we don't want to hear it, man. We start talking about it, they want to go do something else. They don't want to hear the truth because the truth is too hard to take. You know, what has happened here is they used the television and the motion picture industry to turn us into the baddest guys on the planet. We're the worst thing that exists. Every time you hear the music go, you see this dark monster coming. Every time something's bad, it's dark. So now that's us. So now we've been turned into this thing that nobody wants to associate with. They want to get rid of us. They did this to the Jews in Germany. You know, uh, I can't go into the details because it would take too much time. But the fact of the matter is, is we've been turned into this thing that we're not. We're everything but what it. We're not the evil ones. Hmm. We're not we're not the evil people. We're some humble people. You couldn't have brought us all over your own ships and, and enslaved us for four hundred years if we were. Yeah. So that's true. and um yeah. one of the nicest, but we, the nicest people you can meet is right in Clark yeah. Hill, all in the Mississippi and in the South. It's one of the most humblest, sweetest people you ever want to meet. Yep, yeah, but you know some we we've been we've been seeing this other stuff so bad on the screen to now we hate each other. And now we want to kill ourselves. And that's what we're doing. The young people ain't got no more sense. They don't understand what we've been through or what. They don't know nothing about black and proud. They don't know nothing about the, what we went through in the 60s. They just out there trying to sell some dope and kill each other and take some territory. And none of them own any an inch of the territory. So we we got a real problem to, to unravel all of that. It's, it's going to be... A, Hell of a job. I don't think we can do it, man. Yeah, but the, the, the thing is, like I was saying, Charles, is that we just first have to get our head out of the sand and stop being so ignorant on so many things. Um, you know, um, even some of the wisest people, of course, like, you know, so, um, the, the Martin Luther Kings, the Mal- Malcolm X's, um, the Sam Cooks, you know, people who were aware of Muhammad Ali's, um, you know, they were aware of Jim Brown's and so many things that were going on. But the problem was, that they didn't have enough smart people around them who were um, on the same team to be able to push forward and uh, help with the cause. But we, you know, with social media and so much awareness that we have right now, we should be able to fight this fight better than what we're doing opposed to fighting each other. What do you think? I think that, you know, every race on the planet got a place where they came from, from Italy, Italians. Ireland, Irish, England, English. Everybody is proud of who they, of their roots and where they came from. We, on the other hand, can't be proud because we were picked up and brought over here on a ship and forced to work for hundreds of years, and we have no pride. We don't, you know, there's a song called uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing with the Negro National Anthem, and the last verse of that song we sing it so long till we never get to that verse. And the one thing that man says in that song that we should be here is be true to your native land. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We never hear that and we never do that. I'm proud to be an African. I'm proud to be black. I mean, why would it about? Let me ask you a question about that, uh, Mr. Wright, as you mentioned that. It's very interesting. Now, um, okay, Africa is a continent that has Arabs, it has Egyptians on it, Iranians, and it has, um, you know, blacks on it. Now, my question is, um, when they came up with deciding to call um, blacks African Americans, I didn't think that was fitting because um, Morocco is on Africa. Um, Egyptian is African, um, and there's many others, but they don't call them African Americans. It's only the black that they call African Americans. I just thought that wasn't fitting, even though we're not black per se. I mean, very few black people really are the color black. But did you feel? I'm like black as I can be. <laughs> but my question, <laughs> though, is, my question is: Did you see? Did you? Did you? Do you prefer to be called a black American or an African American? Uh. You know, I, that's a good question. I don't know how to answer that question. I, I don't know if I, I'm even American. 
Now, you know, I have a friend called Oscar Brown Jr. Uh, Oscar, he used he he never would pay taxes, and the reason he wouldn't pay taxes is because of the Dred Scott decision, mm-hmm. and uh, it was said that we were only three fifths of a human being. Correct. Okay, and on that basis, he refused to pay taxes. You know what? They wouldn't attack him. They wouldn't do nothing because it, it opened up a can of worms. And we, and none of us would have to pay no taxes. Wow. Yeah. My question, so, my question to Charles, why is it, I mean, I was, I was surprised that um, Obama didn't get that change while he was in office at the, um, on the um, Declaration of Independence because he has the power to do it. Um, to me, he was, he was very great as a president. He couldn't do as much as he wanted to do because of all the racism he had to deal with. If he wanted to just make a law where um, they could have better safety belts in cars, the Republicans would just reject it just because it was him, you know, trying to get that law pushed, even if it was going to benefit people. In, in so what good was it, was it for us to have him as a president, after, especially if you look at the aftermath of what's going on now? What good is it to us to have him as a president if he couldn't get nothing done? What, well, you know, the thing is that um, his intention was to do that, but it's just the fact that... I don't know if it was, but and I, I'm not going to argue with you on that point. But, but the, the fact of the matter, though, is he didn't get nothing done. And as a matter of fact, he was like a front. Like, I hate to say Nelson Mandela. So what, you know, about, what about Mandela? Well, he could he couldn't get, look at the, what the condition of the people in South Africa are in today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, look who's got the gold. Mm-hmm. Look who's in charge of the, of the mines. I mean, ain't nothing changed really. So I mean, well, what good does it do to have a president? When I heard Botha, you know who Botha is, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard both of say, we love Mandela. He, he, he never gets in the way. He's just a good statesman. I heard him say that. Mm-hmm. You know, so that means he's a front. Now, and now, so, uh, now, now, Mr. Rice, have you ever been to um, Africa in all your years? No, I haven't, man. I want to, but I don't know if I want, I'll go... At this point in my life, I've got to be my age, and I, I don't want to get no shots. I don't want to give me no, no vaccines. Speaking of vaccines, there's a site that everybody needs to look at on, on YouTube. It's all over, goddamn, all over the web. It's called the, the Science Agenda to Exterminate Black. Yeah, I, seen that. I want to make sure I, I post that so people can check it out. What's the name of the website? The Science Agenda to Exterminate Blacks. Okay. okay. And here's a white man who's telling us exactly what's going on. We need to check it out. Definitely check it out. It will be posted on the screen. Um, check it out. We can see. Exactly, and I hope you all um, tune in to what this, this wisdom and this profound insight that Mr. Charles Wright has given us this morning. Um, Charles, when we come back from this commercial break, this last commercial break, we want to talk about your hit, Express Yourself, as well as what you have coming up in the very near future. I'm sure I'll, we'll be right back. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm having a wonderful conversation with the iconic musician um, and the hit maker, uh, Mr. Charles Wright. Very insightful. If you missed the last segment of the show, we were um, speaking about um, the situation that happened with Mr. George Floyd's tragic tragedy, as well as um, what's the difference between, or if there is any difference, between what's the racism in the year when he started, opposed to now in terms of police brutality, and uh, Mr. Wright was this, this sharing a story about him um, in Los Angeles, out here in Los Angeles at the age of about 20, being um, attacked as a youngster 
um, by a uh, that was eight, that was just as I turned eighteen when that happened. Eighteen, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. At eighteen years old, just I turned eighteen in California. Now, are you? Uh, do you hold a lot of uh, bitterness or resentment from the things that have happened to you, or, or how do you how do you deal with it um, in this day and age now? I don't hold no bitterness. Uh, I mean, that only hurt me. But I'm a, I, I've remained aware of where I am, or who I am, or where I come from, and what my people are going through. Mm-hmm. Now, um, we, we were speaking about um, this, like one of the um, it, it, the quick story. You know, I'm um, originally from Chicago, and um, I've you know been friends with Her- the late great Herb Kent, who's a um, really big time uh, disc jockey for almost 60 years. Um, in Chicago. good man. Very good man, and he was responsible for a lot of artists getting their big break, black artists getting their big break, just by going against the grain and playing their music um, on his station, such as uh, Bobby Womack, the Shy Lights, um, the Delphonics, so many people. Uh, he's responsible for that. And he used to always play your song, Express Yourself, on his um, <laughs> uh, right before his Battle of the Best um, on Sunday. Yeah. So I love um I love that song. Tell me the inspiration behind that song, Express Yourself. You know, we had a huge song called Do Your Thing. And uh, we were performing that one night at Texas A&M. And it comes to an abrupt end. It was the last song of the show. And when it ended, the kids kept clop, clapping and stomping and clapping and stomping. And only God made me say it because I don't know what else made me say I said, express yourself. They went crazy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I said a couple of other times. They reacted the same way. So I said, shoot. I went to my, dr- to me to my hotel that night and took a pencil and paper and started writing, and then uh, got on a plane the next day. And by the time I got off the plane, I had finished the words. And I came home, started working on the bass line, the guitar line, and I got all that down on tape. And uh, called Ben in, and uh, I had this one guy, Al McKay. You know who that is? I've heard of him. Yeah, he played guitar with Earth, Wind, and Fire. I, I taught him everything you know. He was in my band. But he uh, he wouldn't play it right, so I took the bass player and the drummer one Sunday afternoon and went in and called the engineer and went in and did the track. I came back and uh, played it for the horn players to, to play their part, and they didn't want to play on it. They didn't like it. So it was a piece of junk. So I threatened them to go back and get some of my old studio friends, and they'll be glad to play it, and they grumbled, and they played it. Then I took it to the president you know, of the record. You know, you know, Charles, I just said, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, you know, this, this that particular hit song was, a, was another soundtrack of a lot of movies, and it was more like an anthem, especially for the era, because it was, the way I took it, even in the 70s when I heard it, was um, first heard it, I thought of it as an anthem to express yourself and how you really felt about things, not holding things back. Is that was that your intention when you wrote it? Absolutely, but nobody liked it. I'm telling you, nobody liked it. The president wow. of the record company, that's, that's the president of the record company, told me not to put it out. I would first this, we were working at a disc jockey's club in Detroit when it came out. I gave him a copy. He went in his office, came out, and said, man, you made a mistake this time. I mean, nobody liked it. But I what knew what it like was. About it? I don't know. I guess it was something like they hadn't heard before. I don't know. But anyway, it's in right now. It's in about uh, seven, eight commercials around the world right now. Yeah, it sure is. I, I hear it all the time still. And what year was this, was this song uh, made a hit? 1970. Now, you know, um, this is one, and when I first heard it, it was very interesting because um, Curtis Mayfield was known for writing songs that were a a, a genre of music that was for the time, um, Curtis Mayfield. So when I heard it, I thought it was something that he had written way back then because it was something that I'm sure if he heard it, he would have loved it, which I'm sure he did like it. 
when he first hit it because that's it's it's his kind of style of music, don't you see? I had never thought of that. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> and I'm a Curtis Mayfield fan and the Impressions fan. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and um, and you know, it's it's, it's amazing because um, that you know, a lot of the a lot of the biggest hits for black people back then was music. It was music written about a time, you know, what they were going through. Um, because you yeah. spoke about the time. Okay, I got two yeah. more questions for you, Charles. Um, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and finish what you said. I'm sorry. No, um, go on. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Now, um, music today and the music from your time. Now, let me just set this up. Um, for example, you know, music in your day, you see a young lady that you like. You maybe can't express how you feel. So you put on some Johnny Mathis, you put on some Otis Redding, and let her listen to it, and it explains how you really feel about her. And she gets it, because the music was about singing to women instead of about women. What yeah. is the biggest difference you notice about music now, opposed to your era when you were growing up? First place, my friend, and I'm going to do a, a something on this, too. It's not music. It's it's an assimilation of music. The, they, you can't uh, you can't make soul music using a metronome because that's all they're using an electrical metronome. They turn the metronome on, click, 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 and they start playing the piano with it, and a guitar or whatever with it, and they build up a track with instruments on it. But the track can't go nowhere. The groove can't move because that thing is so stiff, and it's really very bad for the neighborhood. It's it's taking the it's taking the feeling out of black people I agree. because it, there's no feeling in the music, and they and since there's nothing, the music has nothing going. They have to say all kind of stupid and crazy things, and cuss words and call the women all out of their name just to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. And people buy it, and you see them in their car sometimes, and they bobbing their heads because that's all they can do. They can't dance to it, and we are dancers. Mm -hmm. So they have really killed the spirit in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a very unhealthy thing, and that's one of the reasons we're going backwards and we wear our pants down below the crack of our butts and calling each other niggas because we have lost what we always had. And the people that think they can stole and gone with it, they got everything except for the spirit. But it, but it, what is missing on this planet now is good soulful music like we had in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the 80s, they killed it. Now, Just killed it. Now, would you say, Charles, that that's the reason why music like My Girl by The Temptations, um, you know, Smokey Robinson's hit, Daylight, Darkness, so on and so forth. You can Romantic. Into, you can pop it into any genre and it'll still sound like it make, was when it was written 40 years ago. Is that about right? You make people feel good. That's the whole idea, man. Mm -hmm. There's a music that's supposed to make you feel a certain way. And this music makes you feel either afraid or uh, I don't know what it, what a bad emotion it doesn't bring up. And some of it got to loud boom. And let me tell you something. That electrical loud stuff that you hear when people driving in their car, boom, 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 that's bad for your heart. You won't live to be you said, you said, I want, uh, you said who listens to that one to live to be how old? You won't live to be 50 if you keep that up because it, it, it's an electrical signal. It's not real human beings playing it, and it's, it's, it's building your heart muscle up so big till it's going to bust. Wow, wow. Well, you know, my thing is, um, Mr. Red, I love, I love your genre of music. Um, give me some Sam Cooke, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, uh, Jesse Bevin, um, Belvin's, um, you give me Otis Clay and all those great guys, Otis Red and Smokey Robinson, so on. That music you pop it in, I've taught my daughter how to, to appreciate that kind of music 
It is phenomenal. And you can't even depict the year it came out because it sounds sounds so good. It can just you can drop it right in 2020 and it'll be a hit again. So yeah. that's the the era of music that I miss. And I and I always make a joke. And I'm so glad to be honored to have you have had you on the show. Is that I'm on a mission to bring back the doo wop because the doo wop was some of the greatest sounding music I've ever heard in my life. It ushered in the yeah ushered in the civil rights movement. Now now. I put right now I'm just put about fourteen songs. I call my music played by human beings, not by machines. And I and I just put on Facebook fourteen new songs. And they're free of charge. I just want people who in it in this pandemic I want them to be able to enjoy some real music. So now, what, now, it, now, where can we where can we find it and pull it up at? On my Facebook page. Is it Charles Wright? Just pull up Charles Wright, the musician. Yes, on my Facebook page or on Instagram or on some of it on YouTube. But, I mean, they got so much stuff on mine on YouTube, you won't be able to discern those from this one, from those, from these. But I got 14, I take some of my greatest songs right now, free of charge, on Facebook for anybody who wants to go there and check them out. And I'm very proud. Thank you so much for doing that for us, uh, Mr. Wright. Uh, please, everybody, tune in and check it out. Um, go to his Facebook page. It will be posted um, on the screen below. So you can all check out some free music and just bring back the greatness of music to make you feel good. Because I'll tell a quick story. Um, but before I tell this story, let me just um, ask you a question, Mr. Wright. Where can we purchase your book up from where, we be- up from where we've come? We need to know where we can be able to purchase that book. Go to Amazon. Amazon, type in Up From Where We Come by um, Mr. Charles Wright. You don't want to miss getting this book as well. Now, I'll just say, say this last thing and then um, I'll let you go. Uh, Mr. Wright, so when, when I was a kid and um, used to get up in the morning and get ready for school, um, my mom used to play a station called FM 100, and it was in Chicago. I don't know if it was anywhere else that it was in Chicago. But, it had uh-huh. some of the, but what I would hear in the morning, would be some of the greatest music by the Carpenters, the Three Degrees, Sam Cooke, Lou Rawls, um, Etta James. And as a kid, uh, I, I, was, I was born with a photographic memory, thank God, so I don't forget anything. But I, see. I, I um, was four years old, and my mom used to be braiding my sister's hair, getting it ready for school and everything. But that music made me look at life as an innocent, beautiful place that I thought everybody was nice to everyone, and it made me, it had such an innocence to it that I never would feel, forget how great I felt hearing that music. Is that something that you can um, attest to? I did the same thing, man. Once I start, I, once I did start hearing the, the secular music, I went crazy. And, and uh, my father, I couldn't play it in my house, so I had to go to other people's house or to my cousin's house to listen to it. I bought the record. I used to walk around with a stack of records. <laughs> I, know, you know, I know how you feel, man. I know how you feel because that's the feeling I got, man. I know that feeling. Oh, and, and I never wanted that feeling to go. And, you know, Charles, it's so funny to me because um, if I take one of your albums, if I take one of your 45s or 38s, okay, and play it on the record player, um. I like the way it sounds better on a record player than on a remastered CD because your the music in a, on a record player, it captures an era. It has a sound to it that you meant to have based upon the 60s and 70s when you wrote it. Is that correct? It's called analog. <laughs> and this other stuff is called digital. Wow. You know. So that's why it's warmer. It's, it's warmer because it's... It's like tubes instead of transistors. Oh, my goodness. Because when I pop in, if I want to pop in um, um, Curtis Mayfield's um, music, you know, I can't, I got to listen to it um, the way it was he meant it for, that time period, that 60s, that 70s, you know, when he's talking about something. Because all this extra stuff, you know, is trying to bring it up to a time where I don't want to be because I want, I'm listening for it for that time. I want to feel that genre. I want to feel that era. Tab, I don't want to be. That's a good phrase right there. 
<laughs> I, 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 I just, I love it, you know, and it's, and for, for me, speaking to you, Mr. Wright has made my day because you're a legend. You know, um, I have one of my really good friends, Mel Carter, and we oftentimes speak about times long before I was born, but I'm sitting here as a student just listening to everything he says because you don't understand, you know, I've read about you all in books, but to be able to have this television show that the Lord blessed me with to speak to you all means everything to me because you line it up to everything that I read about you in a book. So I'm very honored to have you on the show. Well, I appreciate it. I hope I live up to all of that you're talking about there. Even more uh, so, Mr. Wright, even more so. And I thank you for being a guest on the show. And I thank you all um, for listening. And uh, definitely you want to check out a couple of things. Um, Mr. Charles Wright, he is an icon. And check out his book. Please check out his book, Up From Where We've Come. That's on Amazon. Also, his music that's on Facebook. Just type in Charles Wright, the musician. Make sure you get the music. He's left um, free music that's going to depict um, a time and era and put you in a much better space as well as make you feel more pleasant than listen to some of the things that just make you feel combative for no reason. I'm Sherrard. I hope you have a wonderful Saturday um, and enjoy your day. Be safe. We'll see you in the next episode where we're going to have the iconic Lana Rawls on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you then. Music.